Hey, Tim. Hey, John. Hello. Hey, this is a great day Mm -hmm. for us. Yes. We have the pleasure of sitting in a room right now with someone that you all get to meet. Yes. Tracy Caldwell Dyson. Hi, Tracy. Hi, John. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Uh, Tim, maybe introduce us to Tracy a little bit, and then Tracy, you can fill in the gaps. Yes, yeah. This is a a unique kind of interview we're doing on the podcast here today with a unique backstory. I'll just do a short introduction, which is, Tracy, you are a NASA astronaut. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Which means that your adult job and career has been involved in space flight, space missions, living on the International Space Station for long periods of time. Yes, yes, and supporting the missions that are going on right now and the ones in the future. Yes. So it's such an honor to have you here. Thank you. Um, We're sitting here having this conversation because you reached out to John and I in uh, February of 2023 with a really amazing letter that you wrote, and we received that letter during the months while John and I were having the Chaos Dragon theme conversations. The thing that you talked about in the letter that I'm going to let you read part of in a moment overlapped with one of the main things that John and I were working through, the ideas of chaos and creation, disorder and order, the image of the chaos waters and the dragon in those waters. So you wrote a letter and shared what you're going to share. And my response to you was, this is so cool. Thank you for reaching out. (laughs) Would you want to come talk to us on our podcast about the stuff that you wrote about. And so here you are sitting now months later. Yeah, I <laughs> when I wrote that letter, I had no idea it was going to result in uh, me sitting here with both of you, let alone just uh, starting up a conversation. So mm-hmm. it's been a blessing and a thrill for me. As I'm preparing for my mission, which is to the International Space Station, I launched... Yeah, you're in- going up again. Uh, yes, I'm going up again. I uh, <laughs> haven't got enough of it. Um, and uh, I will be launching in March of uh, 2024. And in preparation for that, there's several things that we um, we have to coordinate. And um, I have an opportunity to have outreach while I'm on uh, on orbit. And I thought that it would be really cool to reach out to all of you uh, mm-hmm. at the Bible Project to give you a little bit of uh, a gift to say thank you for all that you have done for me and mm-hmm. uh, others uh, through the work here, teaching us uh, more about the Bible and, mm-hmm. and how it leads to Christ. So I was uh, also at the same time doing the classroom study mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. Adam to Noah. And Tim, you had made a comment during that time that inspired um, the thoughts that I had uh, mm-hmm. shared with you in the letter. So yeah. the letter was twofold, one to introduce myself and uh, ask you all for your thoughts on maybe connecting from orbit. Mm-hmm. But then I said uh, um, said these words, uh, regardless, I feel compelled to share with you these thoughts I've had from my previous missions and the view of Earth I've seen from space. It's much like an infant placed in a hostile environment. The earth is so plump, tender, exquisite in detail, yet soft in color. It seems so fragile hanging there amid such intense darkness, swaddled in a thin blue blanket of atmosphere. It's so delicate, so vulnerable, and yet so protected from the harshness of space. I could go on and on about it, but suffice it to say, Tim's discussion on the cyclic pattern of biblical narrative in the Adam to Noah series session five video at 23 <laughs> minutes and 47 seconds uh, jarred me as I reflected on my own experience of viewing our planet from the vantage point of space. Tim said, in biblical theology, God's creative power is the power he exerts every single moment to keep creation from collapsing on itself. And I thought, that's exactly the visual I get when I see his creation through the portal of the International Space Station. I've shared this observation publicly before, but I am never sure people really understand me. I'd love to share this view with you, this experience with you and your team. Perhaps you can convey it better than me. Hmm. So. So thank you for writing that letter. (laughs) It's my pleasure. Thank you for receiving it. It's it's been fun. Yeah, we immediately started passing it around the office. Like, you have to read this paragraph. (laughs) (laughs) So beautiful. It is so beautiful. And then to try to imagine what you experienced. Mm-hmm. It's actually really hard yeah. to, tr- to imagine it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My whole vision of reality has been from a relatively small geographical area 
on this orb floating, yeah. hurling through space. And to have the experience of being other than it, looking at it, that's the place we are right now having this conversation. It's, it's almost, it's defying our programming in some way to try and do it other than just having the experience. I, there really, I'm guessing, can't be a replacement for it. Exactly. I, I think the top question I get asked as an astronaut is, what is it like to be in space? And it used to grieve me to try to answer that because I can't give a 30-second answer mm. to that. <laughs> I, it starts to grieve me to think of how in the <laughs> world do I explain to you mm what it's like to be in space. And when I learned the word ineffable, <laughs> mm. I was like, that's it. That's my answer. It's ineffable. <laughs> because it really is mm. hard to explain mm. in a way that you feel what I feel when I look mm. out the window mm. at the earth. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's mm. hard. So we would like to have a more kind of focused conversation about this is, conversation is going to fit into the Chaos Dragon series, because it occurred to me, especially after you wrote the letter, that there really is this important analogy that in our imaginations, I think modern imaginations, the role that the vacuum of space plays mm -hmm. as the, the disordered, the uninhabitable realm. The tohu vavahu. Yeah, <laughs> that's in some way analogous to what the dark ocean or the wilderness represented to the biblical authors. And so I thought it would just be fun to have a creative, exploratory conversation, thinking about what space is in our imaginations. You've been in it. Yes. Um, and if it is, in what ways is it a really good analogy between the chaos waters and space? And then in what ways maybe is it not a good analogy? But before we explore that, um, just real quick, like Tracy from Southern California originally. Yeah, originally. How does a young woman in Southern California end up on a trajectory to living in Houston and being an astro astronaut? <laughs> the only answer I could give is following uh, God's path because um, I didn't start out knowing exactly how to get to NASA and mm. become an astronaut, but I just followed the just followed the things that I was most interested in, and it led me there. <laughs> and um, only by the grace of God can I say <laughs> that I uh, actually made it. But I started out in high school uh, not knowing exactly what I wanted to study in college and uh, what I wanted to be later on in my life. And I shared that, that concern with my parents, and they tried to hold back their laughter at the the seriousness I asked that question because at you know, 16 years old, you don't have to have it all figured out, but yeah. I felt like I did. Yeah. They gave me some great advice at the time to write down a list of all the things that I enjoyed doing. And what that led to was me just with a list of things that at, when you take the collection of no occupation jumps out at the page. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I was back in that, that moment of of despair of, I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> but they said to put it away, add to it, take away from it, but it's yours and you get the exercise. And so then I did. And then later on, maybe a couple months later, the world started getting really excited about NASA and this mission to be conducted uh, uh, in space involving a teacher, mm. Krista McAuliffe. Mm. And it was before the tragic accident, mm. But uh, nevertheless, it got my attention because at mm. that point in my life, I'd never really met a fighter pilot, a test <laughs> pilot, <laughs> but I sure knew a lot of teachers. And <laughs> it really inspired me to, mm. to look more into the astronaut program, to see what were astronauts doing, who were they, what, did mm. they, what skills did they need, what was NASA doing. They were right then building the space station Freedom, it was becoming the International Space Station. And all the things that I read made me go back to that original list. Hmm. And when I looked at all the things that I had put on it, it just said, this is what you want to do. And so from that point forward, I started pursuing a higher education, doing all these other things. And um, I went to Cal State Fullerton, got my degree in chemistry, hmm. went on to UC Davis to get my doctorate, my PhD in, in chemistry. But the only reason I did that was because I could defer my student loans <laughs> <laughs> and my advisor said, you don't have to be brilliant. You just have to work hard. And I was like, oh, I can do that. <laughs> and um, it just led to just greater growth and, and the fun I was having with chemistry. Hmm. I still didn't know how I was going to get to NASA, but I filled out an application. Real quick, for the handful of chemistry nerds that probably listen to the podcast, what 
subfield of chemistry oh, that you do your work in? I was a physical chemist. Okay. I was a peak chemist yeah. um, and, a, and a laser jock, a mass spectrometrist. Um, a laser jock. I was a laser jock at. actually. I don't know what that means, but it sounds amazing. It's such a great term. <laughs> you can use it. It's, it's a real term out there, and anybody that uses a laser knows exactly what I'm talking All about. Right. But, uh, I used a variety of different types of lasers to study the fundamental uh, aspects of molecular and mm. atomic uh, interactions, and hmm. I'm a better person for it. I hmm. mean, it was uh, hmm. it was a really fun time of my life. I, I wow. spent more time with a wrench in my hand than I did beakers with liquids and yeah. making potions. I was uh, <laughs> really uh, just a peak chemist, uh, and, and huh. usually that involves turbo pumps and ultra high vacuum chambers and wow. and special optics. And I got to play with all sorts of stuff like yeah. that. So and wow. you, and that's what you get to do in space too. You get to yes, do John, that that's stuff? really a good point. Uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> I am like totally fixing things all the time on space station because yeah. you don't have a hardware store just down the street, so you got to make do with what you have. And then yeah. you have these specialized pieces of equipment that either produce science or they produce you know air for you to breathe yeah. um, mm. to help maintain the so space station. You're fixing station. things and you're fixing. doing science. Totally mm. yes, mm. that's mm-hmm. that's a w- good way are, to wrap it up. Are you are you allowed? <laughs> to Tell us, like, one of the experiments going on up there. Is it all, like, hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, gosh, it's hard to pick just one. But one in, in the kind of field of physical chemistry or physical science is right. we look at combustion of um, various either liquids, gases, solids. And the reason we're looking at that is not just so that we can understand flames in microgravity, which help us hmm. in the space business, hmm learn how to work with materials as we develop Mm. other vehicles and space stations and missions and things like that. But it also helps us understand how fire responds here terrestrially. So Mm. we're doing some fundamental work in the absence of gravity, basically, to help understand the way flames behave. And it's Mm. fascinating to Mm. watch the videos that Mm. are produced from that, but also the science behind it and the temperature gradients from the center all the way out to the edges. The fact that instead of a uh, one of those the, the classic view of a flame that looks um, bulbous at the at the bottom, yeah, and ball that at the of, bottom, and, the and then flicks up things. Yes, yes, at the top. <laughs> well, a, a flame in space is a sphere. Oh, beautiful, fascinating. fascinating. It's like an orb. An orb, yeah. Oh, you're saying the traditional shape of fire in our imaginations is because of its combustion because of gravity. under gravity. Yes. It's a 1G flame. Yes, in the, in the convection <laughs> that... <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. Because of the convection um, mm-hmm. in the flame. And so there's just a whole lot of science to be gained wow. from that. But then also, as huh. we also have a whole series of biological experiments mm. where we are the human subjects. Mm. And mm. we, you know, go through either certain nutritional diets to to mm. understand aspects of, of mm. how, for instance, protein can, um, from mm. plant versus animal, can mm-hmm. affect your, your bone growth as well as bone loss. Right. Um, great big study on the eyes because as we're finding that um, so there's some phenomenon in microgravity that changes the eyesight mm. of some of our astronauts. And so, yes. and it's not every astronaut. So oh. we've... <laughs> We've got so much brain power um, focused on trying to understand that mm. from practical mm. aspects to just understanding um, yeah. genetics. Uh, yeah, I guess then that's relevant to what would it look like for humans to live in zero gravity for longer periods of time permanently, yeah. mm-hmm. if that's ever a possible, right? Theor- right? Or logistically, what would be the effect on said humans? Yeah. And, it's, a cr- and, it's a really important question to figure out before we do it. Yeah. And it's not just NASA that's interested in going to, to the moon and to Mars. And mm-hmm. if you think about the trip to Mars, it's going to take a little while to get mm-hmm. there. You want to spend some time there on the surface to make the trip worthwhile, and then you got the same length of time to come mm-hmm. back home. Yeah. And that's going to that's gonna be significantly longer than the missions that we even do today that mm-hmm. are six months to a year long. Mm-hmm. So. And you're going up for six months? Yes, that's the current plan. And that's the longest you've been? Or did you, yeah, you did six months? I did six months before. Wow, okay. and, um, and each increment is planned for six months. Okay. But we just had a, a recent mission um, with our uh, NASA astronaut, Frank Rubio, who um, ended up being up there a year just hmm. because of an right. issue that, in the news. that we had with some of our uh, Russian vehicles. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. And it's hard on your body. Oh, yes. But we are, again, um, learning a lot about countermeasures um, Mm -hmm. to our bodies. Like, what do we do to keep from losing bone, losing muscle Mm -hmm. mass, Mm -hmm. 
losing flexibility, those kinds mm. of things. Mm. And so we've got a fantastic complement, not just of equipment on board the space station, but mm. some really fantastic um, mm. people who are doing research in that mm. in that realm, mm. as well as those who are operationally keeping us fit. And so mm. we are probably in the best shape of our lives while we're up there. But you also have to prepare for coming home and your body experiencing microgravity for six months, coming mm. back to one G, as we say, it's an experience of, of yeah. tremendous fatigue. Mm. Like, How long like, was your recuperation? It's about, I would say, truthfully, 30 days before you're feeling like, like your old self again. Wow. But um, 10 days is probably the amount of time you need for for your system vestibularly mm. to, to recover from mm -hmm. being in microgravity, wow. not to mention your muscles and your bones and yeah. things like that. So this is a wonderful segue because what we're talking about is the chaos of space. Is about the mm. the fact of that our bodies, right, are designed and have developed to live in a particular environment to live on the land. Yes. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and very narrow biological parameters, you know, parameters, right? Yes. That we can actually survive and be healthy within. And so what you have been able to experience is a group of humans over the last many decades pioneering what is it like to carve out a space of ordered human habitation mm -hmm. in a chaos realm, <laughs> yes. in a realm that is ho literally hostile and mm -hmm. will take, take you apart. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so here's a way to start the conversation then about how we bridge it to the chaos. So you have been able to go live in this chaos realm, this disordered yeah. realm. What are ways from your experience as you have learned about this kind of the biblical symbolism and the ancient context of the dark chaos waters that are surrounding the dry land and constantly threatening it if, except for the line i guess yes. in the biblical imagination the coastline right marking off the dry land would be the equivalent of what you call it the thin blue blanket yes around mm. that keeps the vacuum at bay um it insulates our planet so I think the experience that you have had, I, I think would be analogous to how ancient people thought about climbing mountains, mm -hmm. which we do recreationally mm -hmm. now, but I don't think anybody would have ever thought of doing that. Just for fun. Right. No, you're going into a very dangerous space. And I'm, I'm sure the effects of altitude, you know, that would be felt by anybody, like ancient or modern who goes up there, or living in the desert, I have, I have this experience going even to eastern Oregon, which is a high desert region, and my skin freaks out after a few days. <laughs> like, it's all dry. and So there's the experience we have. There's the habitable realm, and then there's the chaos realm. So, Tracy, what has been helpful to you learning about the symbolism of the waters and the chaos waters as you think about the experience of space? And maybe, what is space really? Like, what's the vacuum? Right. Like, is it empty? Or what's it full of, anyway? Oh, I hardly know where to start. Um, <laughs> because I think I started thinking about this on my first mission, which was on the shuttle. And it was a relatively short mission where we were up there docked to the station for about 10 days. But, mm. it, you know, give or take a day or two on both sides to get there. But the first time I had a chance to actually look out the window mm. and gaze at space— was maybe close to the end of our docked mission, and my commander just cut out time, and he said, I want you rookies to be in that window for a whole orbit, which is about 90 minutes. Mm. What a gift. Um, mm. And he also requested that the ground team turn off all the external lights on the space station. Mm. Mm. Because believe it or not, there's so much light on board um, the external lights outside the station that, that it's just the same thing as uh, light pollution here where okay. you can't you cannot see all the, stars. The, all the stars because of it. So it requires a lot of darkness um, mm. even on the space station's behalf. But once he did that and, and we could see out, I was just 
astonished mm. at the view I was seeing. I mean, you you could you could literally spin in orbit just looking at the the Earth, especially when you're going over a populated area with lights. Mm. But then when you're you've got your full fill of that, you've got to remember there's a whole universe out there. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, you're, you're look out lo- the other side. <laughs> exactly, just look up from the horizon mm. and you see you see the beautiful stars. And I'll never forget when it popped out at me, mm. you know, from from uh, here and some of the most remote. Sp- places you've been looking up at the stars, you, you're you looking through the atmosphere and all the stars, though some look bigger than others mm. and brighter than others, you still see them all basically on the same plane. Mm. But when you're above the atmosphere, which is where we orbit, mm. you are looking directly at these mm. stars and you start to, your eyes start to um, sense the depth between the stars. And mm. when you start thinking What do you about, mean? Well, it's like that graphic art back in the, the yeah you know, the, the pop out at you. Yeah, and I think you were talking about that on a podcast. I think I have because when I was a kid, they were very popular in the malls. Yes. Oh, yes. the three D the three D art images. Exactly. Okay. You'd yeah. walk by and then you'd sit there for a while to try to stare get, get the image to pop out. Yeah. It was, it's seeing the stars are just like that. Where all of a sudden, bam! The dimensionality. You can really see. You can really see your what? eyes detecting. Like the light years You're right. of difference between okay, you can tell that this star, even though it's fainter, is actually closer. No way. Serious. I wow. I, I, I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't wow. see it. But no it, it it was like nobody told me about that part. Yeah. I was I just remember being just mesmerized so, by that. So, space space becomes three D. So, space uh, becomes three D. And I I'm guess that's probably not something that can ever be reproducible. Through a two D image on a screen that, of a picture you're looking at, I don't know. Like, how even, would you it, represent? I don't that? know how you would because I've tried. I even took my mom gave me like black huh. paper and these huh. neon colors that when I went up for my space station mission and I had hmm. six months, hmm. I could, still couldn't recreate this. I was like, never mm-hmm. mind, because only mm-hmm. only your naked eye and plus you're in the environment where you're like, this is real. It's yeah. not like a, not like a <laughs> replica. Yeah, this is real, and so I think that also computes in your mind like huh. this is astounding. And I remember I was huh. so moved by that huh. yeah. that um, all of a sudden, as I'm staring at it, the image becomes super blurry, and I was like, "What's going on?" And then I rubbed my eye, and I realized I was crying. Mm. Whoa! Like. Tears were welling up in my eyes, but because I'm in microgravity, they don't drip. So it's like this big water bubble coming off my eyeballs. And it was like, oh, and, and I'm smearing it. That's what happens with water in space. It's like if you have it on your skin, it just migrates. It doesn't, unless you... Unless it doesn't you, go down. It doesn't go of down. Of course it wouldn't. It just, and so if you're if There is you're no down. Up, there's no there down. is no down. That's right. <laughs> exactly. So if you're tearing up, it's like this, this water bubble's just growing on your face and um and it was like i had to move the water out of my way so i could so keep could looking wow. so that's how much it moved me Whoa. i know i'm not answering your question well, about the no chaos, uh, this is great uh, but it was just like that was my first view of space mm. and since i was in you know a shirt sleeve environment because the inside of the shuttle very ordered mm. um mm. you know our environment is you know specifically crafted for us to right. to breathe and, and be comfortable. I don't have to wear a spacesuit or a helmet. I don't have to have an oxygen hose connected. I'm just in mm. my element just watching this, and it just moved me so much. Mm. Mm. But it wasn't until I, I my second mission when I was going up in a Soyuz uh, rocket and then um, coming home in a Soyuz capsule, mm. just those two events alone where I was sitting very close to a window <laughs> where I could see the chaos outside mm. through that dynamic event mm. where I realized just how, mm. just what chaos really, mm. really manifested itself as um, mm. in, in my business. And when you've got a capsule going through our atmosphere, that beautiful blue hue that you yeah. see, it looks so peaceful when you're looking at it through a window. But when you're in a capsule coming back home at the speeds that we're traveling, and, yeah. you, and even then you... We're going Mach 25, 17,500 oh. miles per hour. That's that's the speed we have to go to stay in oh, orbit. my gosh. And you don't get a sense for that except for the fact that the Earth is moving underneath you, but you don't have any wind rushing by, and you just don't get any other sense of yeah. that speed until you are going 
home uh, and through it. Yeah. And your capsule, it, there's parts of the capsule that are meant to ablate because it's taking on the energy to keep you safe. But out your window, you're like looking at red flames and, and wow. pieces of your capsule, you know, flying off like they're supposed to. But still, yeah. you're like, whoa, That's alarming. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here and not out there. Wow. So, so um, to, in that moment, yeah, there's a window between you yes. and thousands of miles per hour in the friction and the heat. Mm -hmm. Like not, that is not a space or an experience where a human body belongs. Exactly. A hundred percent right. Yeah. And, and then while I was on my mission, mm. um, we had to do a series of contingency spacewalks. Um, mm. Those just, we had a failure on board that required us to go out in mm. um, short order to fix uh, else we'd have some either even bigger problems. So we had to go out there and um, in our spacesuits, and I was one of the spacewalkers. And just that experience uh, mm. in and of itself where you're, you're as ordered as possible, but you are entering the realm of the uninhabitable. Mm. And it's only by virtue of your spacesuit that you are safe and able to work in that environment. Mm. And I'll never forget the time when I was working on something in the, we call it the, the front face, the forward face of the space station. It's a mm. truss segment that's um, basically facing the velocity vector, the direction that we're traveling. Mm. And um, you're un unprotected in the sense that once that great big fireball comes up over the horizon and uh, shines its light on you, you're going to feel it. Mm. And it's it's pretty warm. I mm. mean, take the hottest place here on, on Earth, mm -hmm. and you might have a, a sense for what that feels like. But when you're in your own spacesuit mm. and that, that sun comes up, even if you're not looking at it, you know it because, um, well, parts of the space station light up in pretty amazing mm. ways. But you can feel the heat even mm. through your spacesuit. Wow. Mm. And then if you don't have certain shields or visors down mm. on, your, on your helmet, it's, that blinding. It, it's blinding, but it's also piercing. Like you can feel mm. it. Um, penetrating oh. your, your, like, I, I remember my temple. I mm -hmm. was like, oh, it, it, it like shot me mm. in the temple. Mm. Um, there's not a whole lot of my skin that's exposed when I'm in the spacesuit. Mm. Um, it's pretty much just your face. And mm. so I just remember that feeling alone. And it's like, thank goodness I've got mm. all this, you know, metal and fabric mm -hmm. that I can turn around and not have that, yeah. you know, directly pointed at me. Wow. Speaking of lasers. Speaking of lasers. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of our favorite things to say around here. Is the sun is a powerful laser. Oh, I, Deadly, deadly laser. Well, and yeah, and let me just add add my two cents. <laughs> I, yeah. I can attest to that. Huh. So, yeah. Huh. So yeah, there's a lot of ways in which, you know, especially when I'm inside the space station looking out the window or if I'm in my space suit mm -hmm. out in the actual environment, it is not lost on me, mm. the kind of chaos that surrounds it.
the chaos oh, yeah. that we are entering. Yeah. It's impressive. Yes. You know, just, well, what were you going to say, John? Well, you know, you, you asked, what is space? <laughs> so, so, wait, wait, wait. Well, that was the last. You had really a string of questions. <laughs> I did. The last one was, "What really is space?" Anyway? So, if if you know, I know what the ocean is, mm. right? Mm-hmm. I think. But yeah, what is if this is a different way to think of a chaos realm? I think we're saying that's appropriate. Mm-hmm. Mm. What is it? What is space? Oh, I don't know if I'm the right person to define. Okay, it. <laughs> all right. Someone must it's have told big, you along the way. It's a big <laughs> It's a big, it's, it's a lot of nothing. Um, it's nothing? It, it's, it, yeah, and we should be afraid of it <laughs> okay. because yeah. it's yeah. it's harsh um, and it's surprising sometimes. We, we're we learning as much as we can about how to live and work in space, but there's still a lot of things we, we don't know. And as we try to, you know, not to sound cliche, but to push the boundaries, um, mm-hmm. yeah. we sometimes are very surprised at what that hmm. boundary really looks like. Yeah. And also, the, we're talking about the space and the environment, but the mm. operational realities of trying to live and work in space mm. have their own layers of mm-hmm. chaos. Mm. And it makes me think about my, my yard at home that, you know, we, we have to tend mm. the garden, right? Mm. And if we don't, weeds grow up and, and undesirable things yeah. take over the, the garden. And trying to live and work in space with a huge global partnership like we have— mm. It's trying to apply order every day to something that wants to be chaotic mm. from from mm. just vehicle traffic coming up and going down from the space station to the amount of stowage mm. that we have on board to take care of our needs for a remote outpost like we have. I mean, just when I think about just the operational constraints that we're under as we conduct our day-to-day mission, mm. Mm. that's that's like mm. trying to make order out of chaos. Subdue the land and rule it. Yes, and I knew one you'd the, say it better than me. <laughs> one of the cre- well, one of the creatures that we are to rule over is the Tanin, Tanin. Mm-hmm. the symbol of chaos itself. Do you see yourself as an astronaut, mm-hmm. being connected to that image of God vocation? Then, mm. Mm. I think you know God uses all of us yeah. um, mm-hmm. in pretty neat ways, and I and I think I get the most joy from what I do, thinking about it in those terms, and yeah. and um, from even the mundane things that well that we we would we consider mundane in orbit, even though the spectacular environment we're in, but um, from those to the spectacular things like doing a spacewalk is kind of a big deal mm-hmm. in our careers, and um, having the blessing to do that kind of work is uh mm. i really feel like god had his hand in that mm-hmm. so mm. i'm curious just continuing to explore the symbolism of the cosmos the biblical cosmos the ordered realm because in a way what you've been able to do is participate in these extensions of eden order mm. into a new realm just outside the planet <laughs> yeah and so it's like pushing out, but it's an extreme example of, I think, a universal human experience that really is what the biblical authors are trying to invite us into, is that humans, I mean, the reason you guys are up there is because of ideas in your minds about designing this habitable, you know, outpost. station, outpost up there. It's just, first of all, that's so remarkable to that's think. moving 12,000 miles an hour, what did you say? 17,500 17, yeah, miles total. Per hour. Wow. And so in that environment, like when I go outside my house and ride my bike to work here every day, <laughs> like I, I am in a way of going up against the dragon. Yeah. There's like cars out oh, there. Sure. I have to watch for them. But your them. skin's not getting dry out here in Portland. So <laughs> no, you got that. Yeah, there's right. But so anytime you wake up and go into the world to bring order and love your neighbor and do stuff, in a way, you're facing resistance. Mm-hmm. And so that the biblical symbols of resistance mm-hmm. are primarily the, the darkness, the waters, and, the, and then the danger in those waters is symbolized by the dragon. So a scholar who's helped me a lot is a, a biblical scholar, Robin Perry, and his fun book called The Biblical Cosmos, I think the an introduction to the weird, wonderful world of the Bible. He has a great little paragraph that I just want to read mm-hmm. and then see how this lands with you. Okay. Because he's unpacking, again, the, the meaning of these symbols and the meaning of, of chaos. Robin says, in the Bible, water and sea beasts function as evocative symbols of overwhelming and powerful chaos and doing forces. They remind us that God's creation is good, 
but not tame. There are forces beyond human control that should be treated with respect, because when they exceed their bounds, they are destructive. We would just pause. So sunlight. I experience sunlight as a really wonderful, pleasant thing here in Portland. <laughs> where <Yeah. laughs> you were experiencing be. sunlight as something very, very different. Yeah. And so, so within the atmosphere, it's like it's ordered and it brings life. Mm -hmm. And then outside of that order, the sun is a deadly laser. It's a deadly, <laughs> <laughs> it's a deadly laser. Okay. So Robin continues. At a metaphorical level, dragons and wild oceans remain helpful symbols of chaos that can invade communal and individual human worlds, threatening order and life itself. Within the Bible, the symbol is used to describe political oppression or the collapse of order in the lives of communities and people. We've been exploring that. Ancient kings are called dragons, violent kings. At a metaphysical level, Genesis 1 depicts a creation that left to itself would collapse back into chaos. The world doesn't sustain or order itself. It is God who ordered and continues to order reality, but the tendency towards disorder is inherent within the world. And the sea represents, therefore, non-being, or literally, no thing. That is so bang on right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's true whether you're talking about the weeds in your garden yeah. or like when a cargo, when yet another cargo ship comes up to the space station mm. of, of mm. limited size and space and we have to figure out what to do with everything. Yeah. And then, yeah, when something breaks on board the space station and we have to go fix it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the, you know, start your pre-breathe and get your suit on and go. It's the perturbation that mm. goes throughout the entire space station, all the way down to our ground teams across the world who have mm. to muster together to bring order back to this situation mm. Um, mm. that, you know, you wonder how it all gets done. <laughs> <laughs> like, how, how is it any of us and all of this is here? Yes. Just so unlikely. Mm. Yes, but. yes, yes. <laughs> and you can't just say, well, it just all worked out. But when you're up there and you see you see it for yourself the mm. through your own eyes, just how miraculous it is that not only are you there mm. and you're safe and you're being productive mm. thanks to the hundreds of thousands of people on the ground who whose job it is to mm. to see to it that you do have meaningful work. Mm. And then you look outside and, and, and then you, you're inside of a space station that was completely assembled in space. Yeah, mm. that's wild. Mm. Yeah. I mean, they, didn't, they mm. didn't put it all together here on the ground and, and plug it all it in yeah, and, right. and check to make sure electrons from over there flow oh, to yeah. over there. No, it all went up into space. Yeah. And that was where the final assembly took place. It's so amazing. Right? It's like the, the biggest, most complex Lego set ever. Yes, exactly. A hundred percent. And just you like going back to the view out the window when yeah. you're done looking at the earth and just completely, like you need a couple orbits to take it all mm. in. Um, and then you look out at space and you're like, that's amazing. I can't believe we're here. And then you look at the space station and you look all around and you see solar arrays going around and, mm. and thermal radiators rotating and you know what's going on with those and control moment gyros that are spinning at thousands and thousands of RPMs to keep the space station oriented oh. in just the right way. Okay. Oh, um, wow. I mean, these are just some of the v real visible aspects, mm. but there's a lot going on behind the scenes that keep that machine running. Huh. Then you, once you're done being like completely in awe of that, you think about all the people who are on the ground in the control centers and yeah. the, the back rooms. Wow, probably and then, at that very moment. Mm -hmm, sending commands <laughs> and monitoring parameters. And wow. um, it, takes, it takes a world to, yeah. to run this space yeah. station. Yeah. And which then raises like the fascinating analogy, which is like, well, what is currently happening behind the scenes? Mm -hmm. that, like, of that the makes, cosmos. That, of the cosmos. Like right. there is for every complex operation to keep that thing up in space. Yeah. There's an almost infinite number of operations happening in the universe to make our conscious awareness of even just this conversation right yeah, now. Yeah. But just the scale of that, we're so habituated yeah. into our life rhythms, the scale and the immensity of the chaos that is being resisted at this very moment. Like we just can't really even take it in. Yeah. But is that kind of what hit home when you we're sitting there looking at the blanket, like <laughs> the, the blue blanket, like there's a sense of, there's my sense of how ordered things are is now a little different. I can see how close to chaos things really are. Mm -hmm. 
so it's it's not it's never far from my mind when I'm looking out at at the view about the harsh conditions out there. That seems to always be forefront to me. I mean, from mm. the the vacuum of space to the extremes in temperature from plus 200 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. When the sun's up, mm. it's at its extreme. When the sun's um, mm. on the other side, it's at its... Uh, 200 other... degrees Fahrenheit to negative 100? 200. So just 200 uh, to oh. positive 200 to negative 200. A swing oh. of 400 Fahrenheit. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. think about what that does to just metal, <laughs> not to mention your own body, but oh just gosh. to the metal of the space station. Yeah. yeah. And just knowing from all the training of being in a you know a pressurized mm. suit to do spacewalks and knowing all the emergency procedures that we have to train mm. in order to overcome a problem that exposes mm. us to that. So mm-hmm. it's 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 always on my mind. <laughs> so then when I get those quiescent moments where I'm just looking mm. at the the earth and mm. all its beauty and grandeur, and I see just then you see the, the mm. that thin blue line or what appears mm-hmm. thin, mm. and you're like. That's all there is. Mm. (laughs) I go out there with a pressurized suit and his visor, two visors. I've got multiple layers on me. I got air pumping into my suit. I got a CO2 uh, removal system. I got a battery here, battery there, radio transmitter. I mean, I'm decked out to the hilt in order to not only be safe, but function out Mm. there and do do Mm. the work. Mm. And then there's this thin blue atmosphere that protects Mm. everybody from ultraviolet high, from the radiation and ultraviolet rays and... And then when the when the sun comes up over the horizon, and the beautiful transformation uh. of the horizon as that sun just like you get hints of it, it's not quite up yet, but you can see things start to change, and, mm. and you're like, it's coming, it's coming. You get so excited to see this, and then, <laughs> and then as it just the sun's about the same size y- as yeah, I experience it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in fact, I'm glad you said that, John, because there's a lot of the things that you see here, you see up there. With a slightly different perspective, like right. the stars for one. Okay. Mm-hmm. 3D um, stars. 3D stars. I'm, I'm disappointed now that I, no. you made me realize I've only ever seen 2D stars. You've only seen 2D stars. <laughs> I've only ever looked at the sky and seen the sky in 2D. I don't, I, and I'm I, a little sad. And I'm, and I'm sad with you. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. So there's 2D stars. Um, mm. And then, you know, that beautiful kind of sunset that you mm. see, especially if you're in Southern California, mm. with a lot of smog. And, and the orange and the mm. You see the that red. on the horizon. You see that on the horizon. You definitely see that. But you see it on a much larger scale. Yeah, you see on a whole sphere mm. of the Earth. And we're up high enough that you can see the curvature of the Earth. Yeah. I mean, you don't see the big ball, but you you can okay. see that it's a, a curve. So right. you you get to see, you know, over three thousand miles of landmass as you're going over at one time. Because sorry, you're um, how high up are you? You're not that high. No, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, we're not. We're, yeah. we're like 200 to 250 miles. So, okay. like, mm. I, I do mm. this in Houston. Like, if from if I'm in Houston and you're in Austin, that's about the distance if you went altitude, you know, wow. high. 250 so miles. That'd I mean, be like here to Seattle, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. that's how far away we are. Yeah. Mm. But you're, you're it would take well, me three hours uh, to drive there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it takes, believe it or not, it takes us eight and a half minutes to get to orbit. Oh, wow. So, yeah, well, a couple you're moving a little faster. Yeah, a little faster. <laughs> a little bit more thrust, but um, and, and, the air, and, the, and the airways are clear for us to yeah. get there. No traffic. But yeah, the, the distance isn't too far, but you're just well above the atmosphere that you see. Hmm. You see things without the filter hmm. of, of our atmosphere. Okay. Um, but the sun glint, you know, when, you're, when you see... From uh, an airplane, just mm. the way that the sun, as it's moving, casts a shadow mm. on the earth as uh-huh. you're as you're traveling. If you're ever looking out the window, you, we see that as well, where mountains look completely different because of the shade mm. that is created by their peaks and depending on where the sun is. Mm. To I love looking at bodies of water where the sun glint is changing it from from blue to like a pearlescent coral color to this Mm. kind of opalescentness. It's just like, it blows my mind away to see that. Um, When you, you're just looking at the earth and all of its beauty and it's just, it doesn't look chaotic anymore. Something that you guys said earlier about the chaos waters made me think about this, um, that the fact that the earth is 71% covered by water Mm. 
is never so obvious as when you're in space. Wow. wow and it's interesting that you can be on several orbits where you don't see any land. Oh. You're just seeing water. And and sometimes you don't see land because the clouds are covering oh, it. Oh, okay. sure. But hmm. you're like, yeah, this is what 71% you know, <laughs> <laughs> looks like because it's yeah. just a bunch of water. And um, when I think about, you know, the chaos, you know, the chaos waters mm. and the dry land appearing, mm. it's like um, mm. it's an oasis mm -hmm. to me. And then just that view from space, I was trying to think about this and set it to words that when I would – Look out and just see ocean, 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 ocean. I'm thinking, I'm glad I'm not there. <laughs> like, like that's in the middle of what seems like nowhere. Huh. And I'd never get that sense anywhere but from the vantage point of space. Yeah. yeah. While flying through space. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not in the I'm ocean. I'm glad I'm not. <laughs> I know. That just sounds so weird to say. Uh, um, okay. All right. So that... Makes me think of another question I wanted to ask you. So that feeling of waking up to a new awareness that the world that I thought I lived in has just become a lot more wondrous and strange and dangerous, that has to have an effect. And I think one of the effects the biblical story is trying to have on our imaginations is to recover that sense of wonder and the fragility of this whole thing. And so the experience that you've been able to have there actually has been a lot of very interesting people who have documented the psychological experience of astronauts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so there's a guy named Frank White, who I know you've met, but he's done a lot of research interviewing astronauts. And he came up with a term to talk about that mental impact. He called it the overview effect, that there's a deep transformation in astronauts' view of the world and reality and other people that happens from getting these experiences that you've had. So you've had your own version of this experience. What does that do? Like when you come back, do you encounter, what do you see differently? How has it impacted? I mean, it probably impacts everything. So I'm asking you to quantify something that's like mm -hmm. unquantifiable, ineffable. Yes. But you know what, when you think about the political challenges of humans getting along or think about a difficult coworker, <laughs> <laughs> How have these experiences shaped how you view other people and how humans do or don't get along down here? What happens there? I think that the those thoughts happen while you're there. Hmm. They start there and travel home with you. But I remember while I was there gazing at the earth and not seeing, you don't see any borders other than those between, you know, land masses and, hmm. and the waters. And you don't see the conflict. It looks so peaceful hmm. from from our vantage point. Plus, you know, you, the only audio that you get is the you know the ambient noise of the space station. Um, so you don't even hear what's happening on the surface of the Earth. And all you see is the beauty and the honest of of again, it's ineffable. You just you, it's hard to put it into succinct terms what that view and the privilege that you have that only a fraction of the human race has ever experienced. You start thinking about, I wonder if more people could see this, believers or non-believers, people who care about the earth to people who think the earth is there for them, how this would change them. You start thinking of, I think those are the first thoughts that, that I have but then it's also, for me, emotional to think about, what am I doing here? Hmm. Why do I get to see this? Why, hmm. why is it me that's hmm. um, getting this opportunity to look at this? And if that's not um, one of the most humbling moments of my life that then brings me back home and has me view myself in light of others, that's where that began. I mean, I think I went through a bit of a transformation after that flight in that alone, just, um, you know, searching my own heart and what was important to me. Um, because before I took that flight in particular, I was, you know, pursuing a career and I was newly married, but not, I was geographically single because my husband was uh, serving in our military in a foreign location. And so I was basically living for myself mm. and, um, Coming back home from that flight in particular, where I spent six months hmm. just being captivated by what I saw at the window, not to mention living life um, and working where I lived and lived where I worked and, 
you know, just the, the chaos of living with people that you didn't necessarily choose to live with, but because of circumstances, you're there together as a, as a crew and a team. All of that just um, forced me when I got home from that mission to kind of look deep into my heart at um, what it meant for me to be there, to be the mm. one of the ones to do all of that. Mm. And just as far as, you know, looking out at the, the planet and how that looks just from just the physical sense, it's both, um, it's as terrifying to look out the window as it is delightful. Hmm. You know, just from the Terminator where the sun sets and there's a shadow cast on the surface of the earth and it moves along the earth just like, you know. Hmm. The, what, the, what's it called? It's called the Terminator. <laughs> it's the lo- <laughs> so not a killer robot. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> it's a shadow line. It's a shadow line. Okay. It's a very That's good, good way to be clear. <laughs> we're right, we're is right this like a NASA here. slang or is this like a true? <laughs> it's. I think it's, I think it's in term. the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't make this Wow. Up. All right. The Terminator. It's the, it's the line of shadow. Wow. And it's to me, um, mm. and I've asked other uh, colleagues um, the same question, how that looks to them. And, and many feel the same way that it's kind of eerie when mm. you see the Terminator mm. yeah. coming, especially if you're, you know, especially if you're over water, because um, oh, as wow. you see the shadow coming Whoa. and it's coming, you're like, oh, it's it's almost here. And you're going to get enveloped and in I'm it. And I'm going to get enveloped in it. When wow. the shadow comes, it unless you're over a highly populated area with lights, oh. it's almost, and for the lack of stars, you would think that you were just looking at the universe because it is black. Like wow. the, the earth disappears. Yeah. Wow. And it's, it's it's scary because you're like, where did it go? But you know it's right there. So oh. it's like, and you can't help but look at it because you're like, I want to see what what it does, but it's huh. going away. It's I don't know. It's a weird weird thought, but it's that kind of thing. Um, I you know I just paid attention to this this mm. feeling I had of of mm. the Terminator coming. Then get this when you're basically just picture our continent and it's you know, over you know what is it like five thousand mm-hmm. miles across if mm-hmm. not more than that. And let's say this blanket of cloud covers the majority of it. You watch lightning go from one end oh, to the wow. other in a split second. Whoa. Right. And, and you think to yourself, I mean, it's, a, it's amazing the maze of lines where if you're here on the earth and you're looking, you see a lightning bolt. Ba-ching, mm-hmm. ba-ching, mm-hmm. It's like you just see these You see streaks. it as a system. Yeah, but up there you, see, you watch electrons flow in no time at all. <laughs> and it's like a, it blows your mind. And, you know, so these things just keep having auroras. Um, oh, man. For a chemist, a pea chemist in particular, <laughs> I'm watching ionization happen. Like in, like I was Whoa. in my own vacuum chamber. And um, auroras, when you're um, <laughs> looking at them from the northern, you know, latitudes and, and you see them as, again, sorry, 2D, um, mm-hmm. you're just watching this swirl of color. Okay. But when you're up in space oh. and you're looking down at it, it actually has height to it, oh my goodness. and it's Whoa. and it's dancing, and and it's you're almost like in a glass bottom boat looking at the aurora, and it's green and yellow, and sometimes wow. it's red and blue, but it's mostly green and yellow. And how often do you go over that? You it just depends on maybe like how every, the Earth is spinning and how you're in our orbit. We call it orbit. precession, orbital precession, orbital okay. precession, sure. and so you um, are at this inclination of fifty one degrees. Okay, and that and as the Earth rotates and as we travel, yeah, you go over the same area kind of like every mm. other two weeks, okay. and and so mm. I, I'm just going to throw a rough estimate about every two weeks you see this. You'll be right um, over it. Okay. Yeah, and wow. there's been lots of video captured of it, and. Mm. Um, my goodness, you just you're, you're just fascinated by the dancing ionization mm. <laughs> of, of you know mm. atmosphere mm. Um, mm. and incoming particles. Mm. And why I'm going on about this is because the other thought I had is how complex mm. this Earth is, and just those things alone. That as the Earth turns, everything that's happening on the surface of the Earth to to weather systems that to us. On the ground, we mm. see t- just a mm. just a fraction of it. Mm. But mm. in sp- it, from space, you see mm. you see how large it is. And to say the, I think we make our world too small sometimes. And with um, internet and communications being as rapid as they are, and how we can hop on a jet and be halfway around the world in you know fifteen hours makes the world seem small. Mm. But it's really big. <laughs> 
it is really big when you mm. think about how complex it is. Mm -hmm. And when we start thinking about that the world is so small and that we are in control of it, mm. then I think we, you know, mm. we that's where we start to step into that worldly, mm. worldly mm. mindset. Mm. But keep the world big, mm. keep the planet big, because mm -hmm. it's it's to God's glory that it is. Mm as grand as it is. And when you realize that, then God seems a lot bigger mm -hmm. than, than we make him sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, what you're saying is uh, a wider realization yes. of the chaos surrounding <laughs> yes. the scale of that right. within an even wider. Yeah, you're, you're giving room your, for a your larger. Your view of God's own wisdom and generosity and power is really scaled to your view of the universe, isn't it? Wow, yeah. that's a fascinating. I was counting on yeah. you guys to wrap that up. Yeah, yeah. And but at the same time, to think because you know, as you're talking about the auroras or a, a storm, that also it's speaking to the unified, right, integrated nature of the oasis, the ordered mm, yes. oasis, and that it's like an, almost like it really is more like an organism, like a big floating organism in the middle of the universe because it's all so integrated, but at the same time, it's just being held there against these forces and lasers <laughs> that are constantly bombarding it to reduce it back to the nothingness from which it came. It's really a marvel that there is anything at all, much less this particular set of things yeah. that we happen to inhabit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like my vision of uh, the universe has been able to expand a little <laughs> by us As talking. As the universe expands, you understand. Yeah, that yeah. But then also I think, you know, the biblical story is also trying to expand it for us as well to help us appreciate both how beautiful and what a gift that is also fragile and on the precipice. And it's somehow holding all of that together in one moment mm -hmm. is something the biblical authors want to instill in us through the story of the chaos waters in the garden. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't wait to for this next mission to um, armed with the, uh, the the deeper understanding I have of Genesis um, alone and to, to see it with that lens applied. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to, mm -hmm. to that experience because mm -hmm. I didn't have it when I went before. I mean, I, of course, uh, was a believer and read my Bible, but I um, wouldn't say that I understood it as the unified story that it is. Mm. And so mm. I'm really looking forward to uh, mm. this next uh, mission with that, armed with that information. <laughs> well, we're thankful that you're going to let us beam in and, and talk with you. <laughs> I'm and so psyched about that. <laughs> you can tell us what that experience is like with that on the mind. Yeah. yeah. Looking yeah. forward to that for sure. Yeah. Tracy, thank you for writing a letter <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and, re and reaching out to us. It's been really fun to get to know you and to share with our audience, everyone listening, you know, this conversation, really, really special. Thank you for coming here to do this and spending time with us. Well, it's been a super pleasure for me and uh, a real honor to come and spend this time with you in this, in this great place where so much uh, creativity takes place. And just uh, appreciate you guys taking us all on this journey and um, that we can, uh, that it's so accessible, even, even from space. Thanks for listening to this episode of Bible Project Podcast. Next week, we're wrapping up this series. We'll do one final question and response episode for the Chaos Dragon. Today's episode was brought to you by our podcast team, producer Cooper Peltz, associate producer Lindsay Ponder, editors Tyler Bailey and Frank Garza. Tyler Bailey mixed this episode and Hannah Wu provided the annotations for the annotated podcast in our app. Bible Project is a crowdfunded nonprofit, and we exist to experience the Bible as a unified story that leads to Jesus. Everything that we make is free because of the generous support of thousands of people just like you. So thank you so much for being a part of this with us. Hi, this is Chandler Wagner, and I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. Hi, this is Jen Apostol, and I am from the Philippines. I first heard about Bible Project in our church. I use Bible Project as a supplement in my personal devotion, and I also use the Read Scripture app 
for my daily Bible reading. I first heard about Bible Project through the Bible Recap, a chronological reading plan and accompanying podcast. I use Bible Project to help set the stage for the book of the Bible that I'm about to read in the plan and to help reorient myself to the overarching narrative while I'm reading. My favorite thing about Bible Project is that it is totally Christ-centered and fully saturated in the Word. My favorite thing about Bible Project is that in this world of distraction, scrolling, and multitasking, it captures my full attention and it provides me with phrases and frameworks to share with others as I learn more about God. We believe the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. We are a crowd-funded project by people like me. Find free videos, study notes, podcasts, classes, and more at BibleProject.com.